the things that we know he did, the things that you, you cannot say it was anyone else, were it was so extraordinary. And you've got quotes from Churchill saying, you know, men who were glittering with baubles and trinkets, uh, you know, they they have nothing on what Jones did. So he was he was an incredible figure. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The air war over Europe during the Second World War is remembered by the aircraft that fought it, the tales of daring do, the aces, and those who didn't come home. There was another battle being fought at the same time in the air over Europe, and that was over radio waves. At the heart of British intelligence was a team headed by the remarkable R.V. Jones. Jones would play a pivotal role throughout the war in the understanding and countering of the advances of the German scientists, both in defence and in taking the fight to the heart of the Third Reich. Today we're joined by Tom Whipple, who is the science editor of The Times. Yes. And his new book, The Battle of the Beams, which looks at exactly what was going on in the invisible space above Europe, and what R.V. Jones and his eventual team got up to. So we had to start in the obvious place. What brings a man from the times to the tale of the Battle of the Beams? There are a couple of reasons why I'm doing this. Um, one of them is an old university friend who uh, I saw 10 years, 15 years even after we left. And he has got really into radio navigation. Um, he is from a company called Focal Point Positioning. Um, and he said, had you heard of this guy? Because he had read the book and the, the, the book being not my book, the book being Jones's autobiography, which has legendary status amongst, uh, cer cer certainly amongst people in the radio navigation community now. Um, and that piqued my interest. Uh, but I also have a family connection. Um, my grandparents met whilst working on radio during the war, or as we, as we, as grandchildren heard it, they were they were working on radar. They were involved in radar, and I think that was probably because the truth, which is they 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 were involved in radio, made them sound like light entertainers rather than pioneering scientists. <laughs> that that would have been a good story too. <laughs> it would, I'm sure. Not to, not war, war, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to introduce Miss introduce Mr. R. V. Jones because to I think to you and I, he's he's a bit of a legend, and you know we've we've both spent far too much time delving in and out of most secret war. But who was he, and where did he come from? Because he sort of literally bursts into the scene in 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 the late thirties, the beginning of the war, doesn't he? Yeah, he was. So at the start of the war, he was twenty eight. Um, he had been. Given this role, um, which was assistant director of intelligence science, um, but he assisted no one and he directed nothing. It was a department of one. Um, the reason he got that role, I think, was largely because um, Lindemann, who was Churchill's scientific advisor, had taken him under his wing, having noticed him in Oxford um, as being a promising young physicist a decade earlier this is great anecdote where he had um completed a physics exam and and there were two parts of physics exam one part was with a sort of just standard physics exam and then the other part was here's some really hard problems and he'd spent his entire time on the other part um and actually not, not done that well on the standard bit but but notwithstanding had so so impressed Lindemann that he sort of remembered him um, and through the 30s, he'd been involved in, he'd gone into research in infrared, um, which was, uh, at the time, everyone was looking, that we, we sort of knew about the, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, the, all of this, uh, this light beyond the visible, and there was this idea that there must be a superweapon in it. And he had looked at infrared as a way of, in part, detecting aircraft and Really, the research was way ahead of its time. I mean, so far ahead of its time, it was useless. Um, and he wasted years on that. But then at the start of the war, he was brought into this, you know, it, it could have very easily been a non-job, um, at least in his account, when 
he was offered the job though which was essentially it was counterintelligence through science it was about using a scientific mind to try to work out what the nazis were doing um and he said when he was off this job uh, a fellow in that position could lose the war i'll take it um which is you know it's simultaneously believable that he'd say it but equally believable that he would retrospectively make up the fact that he'd said <laughs> and and that goes to his character, doesn't it? Because yeah, I've I've put forthright, and that doesn't really do him justice. Because when you most Secret War does read a bit like you know Hitler, my part in his downfall because I did it. That, that could have been the subtitle too. It? <laughs> it could, and look, his so his so his biography is most Secret War, and uh, I, I felt it was time you needed a non autobiography, partly for that reason. Um, uh, and I mean, I go into other things, but you know, the, the, Jones is definitely the spine of my book. And, and yes, you're right. Look, Jones had a, he he robbed a lot of people up the wrong way. Um, there are people like if people know about sort of post-war scientists, people like Solly Zuckerman, who quite clearly loathed him. Um, he was extremely annoying, clearly very arrogant, uh, egotistical. But you know, I think probably the most annoying thing was. He was egotistical with cause. Um, he certainly, certainly, uh, maybe overplayed his role in certain things. But and yet, the things that we know he did, the things that you, you cannot say it was anyone else, were it was so extraordinary. I mean, I think, and you've got quotes from Churchill saying, you know, men who were glittering with baubles and trinkets uh you know they've they've they have nothing on on what jones did so he was he was an incredible figure well let's go to the start of his career really and the beams that are the title of your book the battle of the beams i suppose the obvious question is what were the beams <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, let, let's preface that were they the death rays that everybody was kind of trying to do which i i love because it's very very wellsian sort of you know heath robinson sort of stuff yeah. anyways what what were the yeah. beams well yeah so so let's let's start, start briefly with death rays so as i said everyone thought that there would be a super weapon amidst the electromagnetic spectrum to the extent that um in the uk there was a uh the, there was a competition, uh, an official sort of forces competition, which, which was run to see if anyone could raise the temperature of a sheep um, at a hundred yards you, using a death ray. And you got these this fantastic cast of charlatans. Um, what, one of one of my favourite bits of this was um, there was in um, in, in a magazine um, there, there was this this character who was convinced that he had made a death ray, or rather he was prepared to convince other people he had made a death ray. And in the August 1924 edition of Popular Radio, um, he wrote how, this guy called Harry Grindle Matthews, um, how he had, he had made the most terrible invention ever made by man. A, uh, and he, he had used his death ray, which could ignite gunpowder, down planes, stop engines and kill. And he'd used it to kill a mouse. Um, and there's this marvellous uh, description. That as this beam of light crept up and finally struck full upon the little animal, he reacted exactly as he would have done to the shock of a light wire grounding through him. He was killed very quickly. But what I love most about this entire account is that it was not the lead story in popular radio. <laughs> popular radio, its cover story was how to build a two-tube reflex receiver. So this shows just how passe diabolical death rays were in 1924. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, we, we have this idea, and it eventually made its way to actual serious scientists who said, look, you know, We've got some massively powerful radio towers, um, and you don't see scorched earth next to them. Uh, the, the idea we can use it for anything like this is just inconceivable. Um, but one of them in particular, so Robert Watson, what he added an amendment saying, 
But if you ask me, basically the amendment said, ask me a sensible question, I'll give you a sensible answer. We could use these for bouncing off incoming aeroplanes and seeing where they were. So, of course, that's the story of the genesis of British radar. But the Germans weren't interested in a defensive war. They weren't interested so much in seeing what was coming as being the thing that was coming. Mm -hmm. And what they had uh, was a system of beams. Um, now, there are actually three of these, and we, we can get on to them. But the, in the very basic level, they were able to paint a cross over the target. And you had one very thin, and we can get on to this because it, it's crucial, one very thin radio beam that the bombers would fly down, and then they would wait for the signal of the other very thin radio beam. And when that crossed their beam, they knew they could drop their bombs. Now, how do you get a very thin radio beam? So if you think radio is light, it, it's, it's a form of light. If you've got a torch and you switch it on, you get a cone. You get a cone of light that very, very rapidly spreads. Um, and if someone was to say, why don't you go down the, the route of that torch? Well, you'd say, well, look, it's anywhere within a 60 degree angle or whatever. Um, so how did they do that? It was it was very clever, and it was an adaptation of something that was actually used for landing planes anyway. Well, if you imagine, instead, you've got two torches, both with a cone going out at 60 degrees, and you angle them so that the edges of the cone just touch. And that's what they did with radio, but the, one of their radio torches um, made dots. It went dot, 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 dot. The other one made dits. It went dit, dit, dit. And at the point at which they grazed, the dots precisely filled the space in the dits, and you got a continuous D. So if you heard the dots, you knew that you had to turn right. If you heard the dits, you knew you had to turn left. And when you heard the continuous note, then you knew that you were on the right target. It's a... Now that you've explained it, and I'm going to say it sounds remarkably simple, it, it's very complex to get it to work. But the ability to just sort of navigate using those mm -hmm. those little tones of the pilot was revolutionary. You know, you have the the Lorenz system, which I guess is based on for, for helping people land. The flip side of that is the UK was always a little bit behind when it came to navigational beacons and and things like that, as opposed to Europe and and the States. So I guess is that where knowledge gap comes in for the British establishment when they start trying to figure out what the heck is going on? Well, they didn't. Yeah, they, they didn't believe. There were several reasons, I think, why they, they didn't believe at the beginning of the war that these beams existed. And, and to be clear, there had been hints. There was an intelligence dump, an astonishing intelligence dump that's come to be known as the Oslo Report, which certainly made it clear that they had systems for... Uh, precision navigation in this way. That, that, that described a slightly different beam. Um, and there, there were various other things, but there was, there was institutional reticence about it. One reason was we didn't think they were necessary. Um, we had this idea that you could, you were flying above the clouds, you could use a sextant, um, you could navigate like mariners of old and find out where you were. Uh, and we maintained this, and this was this was the reason why, which it's with only minimal hyperbole, our, our, our bombing campaign was, you know, largely pointless for the first two years of the war. You know, we, we'd, it turns out that you can't navigate with a sextant, <laughs> um, particularly when the, the people flying the planes just want the slightest excuse to drop their bombs and turn around so they don't get shot down. Um, so uh, we, we didn't believe that. We also didn't believe it because these beams would have had to have curved slightly around the Earth. And it wasn't clear that the physics would have let them reliably do this. Um, and then, of course, there was just good old fashioned British chauvinism. We, we, uh, we had, we'd made radar, we'd you know, mastered the electromagnetic spectrum, and, and we were sure that no one else would have been quite so clever as us. Of course not. No, it's, my 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 dear boy. No, no. <laughs> we'll get on to the sort of discovery that the Germans were a little bit further ahead than everybody thought 
a little bit later with two of the my favorite moments the looking at the graph span going what's that and then operation biting but we'll we'll come back what were the beams that the germans were using because i guess the the key element that really comes in is france falls so that they're able to not have to project these all the way from germany they can use a much more focused focused beam from the low countries yeah. and, and and france yeah exactly that so so there's weirdly there was this uh, there was this debate about whether the beams could uh, bend around the earth and we, we were having that at the point where it didn't matter because as you say they could bring them right up to the french coast so whatever theoretical problems of projecting these from germany were irrelevant um but yeah they had three beams they were incredibly if, if, forgive me the sort of national stereotype very germanic about it i mean i i, I just i mean i you know we can only stereotype but i'd imagine britain would have made one beam system and been really pleased with it germany made one which was called Knickerbine, which is the one I just described. And that was the simplest with the, the grazing torches and the signal. They made another called Excurate, which was similar, but the signal was transmitted electro and read electronically, and it controlled a display. So you could see where the, on a display, a needle would tell you whether to turn left or right. It made it far harder to, to jam because... You know, you can confuse a human ear. It's a lot harder to confuse a circuit. And there were, there were several other uh, intricacies about this, which get quite complicated, but it had several cross beams that effectively measured your airspeed and then could adjust when you needed to drop the bomb. Um, the third system, y -Gerate, was completely different. It controlled individual planes. And, and what happened was you had a receiver on board that, it received a uh, radio ping from the transmitter. It re-radiated it back. And from the time it took to travel, it told you how far away you were from the transmitter. And then it had a separate beam system, which meant that you also knew the direction you were on. So it was basically like a clock hand. And the clock hand took you in the right direction. And when you were the right distance from where you started, um, you knew you had to drop your bombs. So they had these three systems, and they used them sequentially. So uh, one was used and discovered, another one was used and discovered, and so on. So how effective were they, if we're saying so, July, August 1940, when these things were being used on, on daylight raids? We're going to come to Coventry in a bit, but how effective were these in getting, when you would think it's daylight, over, well, daylight to England, there's going to be clouds, but how effective were they of getting their bombers to the targets using these devices that were making the boffins think there was something to help them? So there were meetings at the air ministry where people were saying, we know something's up because <laughs> they're all flying over the same point, um, <laughs> which seems sort of <laughs> incredible that they'd be able to do this. And, and there was talk that there must be fifth columnists with radio signals inside Britain. It was a time when we were, there was this weird thing where everyone was convinced that there'd be nuns. Nuns were going to be, <laughs> the German paratroopers were disguised as nuns. And there's, there's these amazing official documents where people talk about, there's a describing, there's this thing called the listening project where uh, they essentially went out and, and caught the rumour mill. And there's one that sort of ends up saying, and of course, there were the usual rumours of the hairy-handed nuns. Um, but, but, you know, they, they, they could see that something was going on. Um, and, and how effective were they? Um, there was the theoretical accuracy where you were talking to a few hundred yards. Um, there was the fear where, you know, we, we, we have recordings of um, you know, prisoners of war who didn't know they were being recorded, who, who talk about kind of being able to blow the bloody doors off. Um, in, in reality, what it meant was they were largely in about the right place, um, which was, you know, it's not precision bombing as we know it today, um, but it is was a massive, uh, a massive advance. And what it meant is they didn't have to bomb during the day because during the day we could get them, you know, the British radar meant you could send the fighters to where they needed to be, um, and daylight bombing, I think, all, all sides and, until the, the, the very end when the, the US had their massive you know, high-altitude high bombers. Daylight bombing just wasn't feasible 
um, from early on in the war. But what it meant is they could get it by night. Um, and this was when Stanley Baldwin had said in the 1930s, he'd given this famous speech in Parliament that the, the bomber always gets through. And this was the thing, this was the worry, that if they can find where they need to be at night, we simply don't have a way of stopping them. They, they, they brought in flak to protect London, but everyone who knew what was going on knew that the flak was just, the flak turrets were just, just there to uh, provide a morale boost. You, you were aiming at something that had moved three miles in the time it took the flak shell to, to reach it. The thing I love about this part of the story is the many different sources that Jones, who's still on his own, is starting to piece these things together. So you mentioned the, the Cockfosters cage where they're tapped into just about everybody was was being listened into in, in, in there. See Helen Fry's book for that. Um, how was he putting together what he thought? Because he, he'd already taken a flyer on the beams, hadn't he, with Churchill, and now he was having to back up his cards. Yeah, so he started, he, he was he started his role on his own. Um, it, it began, I think, then with this Oslo report, which was a German engineer who was anti-Nazi. He uh, was in Norway before it was occupied, and he managed to get this report to the, um, the British uh, consulate, and uh, it was astonishing. Um, it, it was astonishing in the level of technical detail. It described all sorts of things, you know, guided missiles, rockets, um, you know, all of these things that came to pass but seemed fantastical. It also described a beam system. Actually, the one it described was Y-Gurit. So there's this weird thing where Jones knew there was this beam system coming and he kept on finding beam systems and they weren't the beam system that he was <laughs> expecting. Um and uh, this and it, this gave gave the first hint. Then, as you say, there was the Cockfosters cage. As as German airmen started being dropped, being shot down, they would be taken um, for interrogation, and most would be uh, would do their duty. They wouldn't give up the details. But the, the brilliant thing was, I mean, it's so simple. Um, no, no sort of resorting to thumbscrews or anything. These polite British officers would ask them the questions they wanted to know the answer to. They wouldn't be given the answer. Then the German prisoner would go back to his cell, chat with his cell buddy. His cell buddy would say, what do they ask you? And he'd say, oh, they asked me this, but obviously I didn't tell them. And then, and then would, you know, more often than not, would describe exactly what was needed. <laughs> whilst in the next room, a gramophone etched a groove in a record recording exactly what was said. So that's one of the things then there was Things like, you know, there was a downed airman who had his notebook, which contained you know, coordinates from uh, Cleve and Stolberg, which were the, the sites for the Knickerbein Towers. Um, and he, he tore it up into you know, 100 pieces, which were then painstakingly put together uh, 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 by the next morning and taken to Jones. And through all of these things, he, um, he pieced it together. And then there was this climactic moment where, he was brought into Downing Street. He was told to go to Downing Street. And because he was in Department 1, he, he always turned up late. Um, and so this message was waiting for him to be in Downing Street, which he thought was a uh, practical joke. Um, so he arrived 25 minutes late for this meeting, which had the most important people in the Air Ministry and you know, Churchill as well. Um, and they were having an argument about whether these beams existed. And then Churchill asked him a question. And he said, and we have this source from Churchill as well as from Jones. Um, he said, you know, perhaps it would help if I started at the beginning. And Churchill says, you know, like, like being in the presence of the master detective, Sherlock Holmes or Monsieur Lecoq, uh, he, he outlined the, the, the schemes and the strategies. And, and, and that was all that was needed. He convinced Churchill that these existed. They sent a plane up and the plane heard the dot dot and the d d d and they found the two beams and they crossed over derby where the rolls royce engine factories were so that, that was the end of the uh disbelief in the beams um, and then they just needed to do something about it 
I have to take issue with you about that bit of your book. You're you're a bit hard on the old ants, and the ants are great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you say old and antiquated. It's only five years old by that point, my dear chap. It's yeah. <laughs> Aviation was aviation was moving fast. It was it was crummy enough that the RAF could spare it for a listing job. But yes, yes, maybe I am. I'm overly harsh on the plane they used. They didn't need they didn't need the cream of the RAF to to listen out for the um, sort of sounds of the beams. We laugh because we're about to get to the the, the dark moment. Really, you so say the beams are, are are crossing over over Derby, and of course when they're put to their most effective use is the Coventry rate. So for those that don't know what happens on that, because it is really a perfect storm, isn't it? But how is all of these tools used to create, at the time, the, the perfect night raid up to that point? Yeah, so we so the, the, the Coventry raid happened in November of 1940. And by then, they had discovered these beams, and they had blocked these beams to a large degree. But the second system, the X grade, was in place, um, and this was to be used as a pathfinder. They hadn't got time; they hadn't had time to stick it in every plane. So, an elite pathfinder unit was given the X grade, um, which its theoretical accuracy was, was astonishing. In practice, because it was brought out so fast, and the pathfinder unit was using incendiaries, which uh, get blown about in the wind, they're a lot lighter. It didn't have that accuracy, but you know it doesn't matter if what your plan is is to just annihilate a city. This was so the British got wind that there was going to be a raid in the Midlands, and it was going to be different, and it was going to be called Operation Moonlight Sonata. Um, and this was really a raid to test the theory that you could win a war with bombing, and it was about this idea that you can sufficiently demoralise a population that they capitulate. So this was, everything was going on this. And the Pathfinders went out. By this stage, Jones, and again, this was, to be clear, this really was, to a large extent, Jones alone, had worked out almost all of the x system. He, he had gone through the technical specs, and it got almost everything, um, tragically not quite everything. Uh, there's there's a, this sort of dark aside where a week before the raid, one of these elite planes had crashed on Chesil Beach and it had landed there complete with the equipment, which they didn't destroy, but it had landed on the edge of the beach where the tide came in and the army turned up to claim the plane. And then the Navy turned up and claimed because it was in the sea that it was theirs. And whilst they argued, the tide came in and you get this ludicrous inter-services rivalry, which meant it delayed looking at it. But anyway, the night of November the 14th came along and they were guessing at jamming. And uh, you know, Jones writes, it was this, you know, it was this most diabolical guess. Um, if, you know, if you get it wrong, 500 people will die. Um, and as it turns out, he didn't actually get it wrong. Uh, something else was wrong. And the next morning he woke up to find that 500 people did die. The, the bombers came in. Um, it was a beautiful moon at night. And uh, the pathfinders dropped their incendiaries and they lit up Coventry. And then wave after wave came in. And you get these you know, amazingly emotive uh, accounts of the people on the roof of Coventry Cathedral trying and failing to save it. And then a city wakes up the next morning to annihilation. And it is in, in Germany, Goebbels uh, coins the word, uh, the verb coventrate, uh, meaning to, to reduce to rubble. Um, and this is one of the great, you know, what ifs. What if they've got that final piece of information out of that, out of that um, downed, um, bomber and were able to set the channels to the right frequency. Now we don't know. My actual suspicion is that probably they'd have made it anyway. Um, it was a very, very hard system to jam. As I said, this, this one was the one that they, it read it electronically and threw to a needle. It was very hard to get enough electronic noise there to affect that properly. And it was a moon at night. It was beautiful and it was clear and they could see their target um and 
this is one of the ones. So we, we know that they, they jammed Knickerbein and we know they tried to jam X great and to an extent succeeded, but it's still not clear how much they succeeded. So the, the great myth was the bending of the beams, because even, even the Germans thought the, the beams were being bended, but they're essentially just turning the volume up on the stereo to 11, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, it depends. Initially with Knickerbein, there was, um, there was desperation. Um, uh, and what they did with that was they went into hospitals and they stole these things called diathemies, uh, diathemy kits, which were used for cauterizing wounds and were the only thing they could think of in Britain that could project something powerful enough at the right frequency. And that just created a fuzz. That created a noise on the right frequency so you couldn't hear the note. Very rapidly, they then developed better things, which created the, the, the dits and went deep. The, the, so that wherever you were in the sky, you kept on thinking you had to turn. Um, now, with enough effort, they could have made them syncopate properly so that you'd create a false beam and you could have bent it somewhere, but you, you didn't have time. Um, so uh, as it turned out, the crude are just, just making the whole sky sound like you had to turn was enough. Where they did get clever, um, was with the final beam system. They had time, and again, Jones had anticipated it and worked it out. This was the one, the y rate, where you pinged back a signal and it measured how long the signal took to, to go, and from that you knew, knew your range. Um, for this one, they used the TV tower at Alexandra Palace uh, and pinged back the same signal. So what you ended up was a bit like that thing when you're at a wedding and the you know the best man picks up the um, picks up the microphone <laughs> and nervously walks in front of the speaker and you get this feedback and this wail. That's sort of what they created, but they did it subtly, so that no one was quite sure. And then they raised the volume and raised the volume, and raised the volume until until they realised that they they had indeed been found out and it's all been for naught. Um, so that was the only one they did really cleverly the rest was was on the fly and as, as fast as they could we're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the pima air and space museum with head of collections andrew bowley here we are again at the pima air and space museum um, we are inside one of our exhibits that we call the bing so you might ask what is the bing so during operation enduring freedom the early first couple years of a10 operations in afghanistan one of the first units uh, built uh, one of those temporary structures that were all over the place. I think they're called bee huts, if I recall correctly. And they turned it into what they called the Bing, which was kind of like a lounge slash clubby area for the A-10 pilots. Why was it called the Bing? Well, it was named after the strip club and the Sopranos. And that's why it was called the Bing, because that was when the Sopranos was going, going on and was really popular. The interesting thing is the first unit was very specific that they wanted no televisions, no arc, you know, video games, computers, or anything. It was a place to kind of, you know, have some drinks, relax, play some music. They left a code of honor saying no televisions, no video games, etc. with a photo of the cast of the Sopranos, you know, just threaten them. So what did the next squadron do? Well, they put in a television and started playing video games. So that's what's kind of interesting about the Bing. It's kind of this interestingly organic kind of thing that happens during the war that just kind of becomes different things and expands as it goes on. So, it, you know, it was in multiple iterations because A-10s were, you know, in Bagram, Kandahar. So they would take all the stuff off the walls, move it down to their next designation and put everything up. Um, a lot of the stuff is just random stuff off the Bing. It's a lot like a college dorm room you know you have your you know velvet elvis artwork um that looks straight out of a night you know 90s college classroom the the plaques that you see along the walls with the squadron deployments and everything those were actually not in the bing they were in their ops shack but they brought all those back so again you know stealing signs putting them up on the walls um every time an a-10 pilot did a deployment to Afghanistan. They left one of their name tags or patches on the wall. 
So if you did more than one, then you left more than one. So some people you'll see multiple ones. Uh, you see some exchange pilots from um, foreign air forces that were flying A-10s. Um, I have to say this was a really fun exhibit to work on because it's a little different than the typical um, you know, uniforms, flight gear. And talking with the A-10 guys, they were really, really good about sharing information and being kind of open about things, you know. Like the bars had places to hide alcohol because technically they weren't supposed to bring alcohol into Afghanistan. So, you know, they would put, have alcohol sent to them in Listerine bottles and stuff like that and then hide them in here. Another interesting thing is um, they had a pink flamingo that whenever they were doing stuff like, well, drinking or doing whatever they don't want their CEO to know about, they would put a pink flamingo outside the Bing just to let the commanding officer know that now would not be a good time to enter the Bing. But it's in, the guys who, uh, the guys that we worked with on this exhibit were really good and really interesting and uh, I had a lot of fun doing this exhibit, or we all had a lot of fun doing this exhibit. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. I love that there's Ali Pali sitting there because they've turned the TV the TVs off for the duration, and it's like, oh, let's just use that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the. Dear listener, there is far more to it than, than that. We you know, encourage you to buy the book. Links in the description, all those good things. That's just the first part of Tom's book. And there, there is a bit where you say you can skip you can skip the maths over this bit. <laughs> I think, no, make, make everybody read the maths. Or make them read the maths. Because the other side is, as we mentioned earlier, the British think they're the only ones with radar. And it's, it's a lot like the, the jet plane. Yeah. Whittle has the jet engine, no one does. The Germans fly before. He, it, there's all of these funny little parallels. Why did the, did it just come down to arrogance that, oh, we've developed this incredible thing? Because you've got that great line in the yeah. book with Churchill saying, oh, did they, did they find one in France and they've, they've started using it? Yeah. What, <laughs> sure, surely it cannot be that British. Or is it? I think it is. I, I mean, <laughs> it, even more so than the beams, the radar, if I miss five, so there were seven or eight countries who were developing radar before the war. Um, and it, it wasn't just that we should assume that the other countries, you know, the adversaries are as clever as us. Um, they told us. Because <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> there, there was this, this liaisons that the RAF and the Luftwaffe had uh, with each other before the war. Um, and and in one of those, what one of the uh, Luftwaffe officers, I don't know if he was drunk or not, he's but basically said, how are you getting on with your radar? <laughs> we, we've got this too. Um, and obviously this was written down. And then there was the Oslo report, which described something very radar-like. Um, now, the Oslo report, I should say, was dismissed at the time as, as, as sort of a clever intelligence ruse. The assumption was that the Germans had planted this information to trick us. But even if they had, the information they had planted described radar. So, you know, they, they knew the concept. Um, then you get the Graf Speed, the, uh, this pocket battleship, um, where it, there was this early, largely inconsequential, but but you know dramatic naval battle at the start of the war. Great, um, great movie too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's um, it captured people's attention, I think, probably because you know there hadn't been much else going on by then. Um, and it was in this in the South Atlantic, uh, and the the Graf Spee was eventually. Um, hunted down it be, it had been taking out merchant shipping it was hunted down and it took port in montevideo in uruguay and uh through some quite nice deception um the captain of the graf spate thought that he had no hope and so he scuttled the ship um but managed to scuttle it in quite shallow water so that it just sat there half in half out um you can see in the pictures, if you, look them up, you can see something that, you know, this sort of arrangement of antennae that look quite radar-like. Um, Britain bought 
the Graf Spey as <laughs> scrap metal um, through a front company. And uh, so our, our scrap metal dealer went on to have a look. Um, he said, yeah, look, this is clearly radar. Somehow this got memory hold and this wasn't taken seriously. It was forgotten. It would be two years um, before this was fully accepted. And it involved photographing it and hearing it at the same time on, on the right frequency before the uh, British finally accepted that the Germans had it. And as you say, they um, they attributed it initially to the fact that some some British radar had been captured at Dunkirk. And it had, but the, the Germans had looked at it and, and thought it wasn't, wasn't much cop compared to their radar. And we, we must mention the dear Lubbershire Bainbridge Bell, one of the the, the greatest <laughs> names in the Second World War. It is. And please, I'm going to try to remember that. I thought I was going to get this double barrel crazy name wrong. He was the scrap metal dealer in question, yeah. yes. And, yeah, s- scrap metal, we say. With him, in yeah, his he, his other hats on it as well. That I think in um, Alfred Price's um, in- instrument. Um, oh, his, uh, Instruments of darkness. Yes, that's the most angry I've read. Price is it's like the guy had it. He had it right there. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like you say, it's, okay, two years later, then all these weird things start uh, appearing appearing on the coast. So. Let's bring Jones back in. How does he start to unpick this? Because what's the, the th- this is this is where my fascination comes in because we've got the you know, Sea Cat, Freya, Fritzberg, and all the different manifestations of them. How does Jones start figuring this out? Because he's got a friend now, doesn't he? To, he does. To help. It, his department of one has become a department of three or four. Actually, he he got Charles Frank. Um, who was his old Oxford buddy just before the Coventry raid. And then he gets another guy, Derek Garrard, who um, the first thing he does is he, he heads off to the South Coast to listen out for, um, uh, for, for radio signals and, and German radar and gets himself arrested as a spy entirely recently. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he has friends. Um, and uh, Jones starts... Um, he starts befriending the photographic reconnaissance unit, who is an entirely um, di- different sort of element of this. And there's, there's a lovely book, uh, Spies in the Sky, um, and I'll remember the author in a sec, um, but uh, which describes their, again, sort of from the ground up, they created a science of what do things look like from above? Uh, and it's not always what you think. Um, there's this marvellous anecdote where they kept on finding artillery placements in the middle of fields and uh, and farms. And it turns out if you tether a goat, it'll graze in a circle that'll look a lot like this, the circle that we'll have for an artillery placement. Um, he befriends them. Um, and he, again, and, and the wonderful thing is sort of sitting down, this rare quality of being able to sit down and just think, what would I do? How would I do this? Um, and, and then piecing things together. The other thing he has is uh, a, a spy network. We're now starting to get in reports from um, people in occupied Europe, um, incredibly brave, particularly the Belgians. Um, there's, he, he, he gains great respect for the Belgians. Um, so uh, one of them, Manages and the, the real sadness is we, we don't really even know who a lot of these people are. You know, very few of them lasted the war, no one knew at the time. But one of them just steals a map. Um, there's <laughs> you know, there's this sort of excellent thing where Jones said he thought he thought he's sort of imagined that the guy just got tired of driving or cycling around recording each of the radar stations so he just broke in and, and stole the entire map for the south of belgium <laughs> showing where all of the radar were you can't let it pass without talking about thomas snorm who was a um a, a, one of these amazing characters come out in war he, he was a, a danish pilot who i think basically just wanted he, he felt his war had been taken from him um and he wanted some action, uh, and he had action in the most astonishing way. He took a video of one of the um, Freya radar, which is the ones that could see further, moving uh, 
um, and he wanted to get this to Britain. And I actually think it would have been better, safer, easy, certainly easier, certainly safer, but probably better ways to do it than one he lighted on. But he s stole... That, that, that doesn't make for the fantastic story, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> it doesn't. He, 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 went, he befriended a farmer who had a biplane, which didn't have any wings. Um, the farmer says, you can have it, but if you get caught, I'm claiming you nicked it. So in the dead of night, he and his friend um, broke into the, the farmer's shed, attached the wings, um, flew off in this biplane. Um, now, bear in mind, they'd just, they'd just spotted radar, so they knew that they would be tracked. <laughs> the entire luck of this coincided with Operation Barbarossa, and so most of the German planes had gone to the Eastern Front. Now, over the North Sea, they climbed out onto the wing to refuel the plane, and then they very nearly got shot down riding in, in Britain. Um, but they, uh, they, they brought this film to the UK. Um, <laughs> the UK um, the, took it to the post office to develop it and managed to destroy almost all of the frames, which <laughs> it was justifiably <laughs> quite cross about. Um, but we've got all these sources, and, and, and from this, um, Jones begins to build up, build up a picture of how the German radar system worked. It worked on this brick structure where you had a brick of one radar and then another type, which we'll have to get on there because it's crucial, called Würzburg. So the Freya would spot the, um, the plane coming from about 100 kilometers away. The Würzburg had far less range, but it could do altitude, and it would lock onto the plane and you could use that to guide a night fighter, in fact, that and another Würzburg following the night fighter, to guide them precisely onto each other. And it was an amazing setup, um, very different from the UK's setup. Um, uh, 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 one of the German generals described it as this whole thing was an excrescence of one night fighter. You've got the, the, the people plotting the position of each of them, three radar, all to get this one night fighter on target. But this brings us on to Würzburg. Würzburg was a lot smaller. Um, and it was spotted, uh, it was a speck in a reconnaissance photo, but a speck with a path going to it. And Jones ordered a, another flyby, uh, a lower angle, and they got a shot of it. And it was, it was what radar should look like. If you're imagining in your head radar, this is it. It's the dish, the dish that rotates. Um, and there's this marvellous realisation they come to that this is on a cliff edge um, there's a ramp down to the sea and they don't need to they don't need to use their scientific prowess to work out what it is they can just send some people in to get it the pru flights because it's it's one of the first the um oh the name's gone straight out of me um cap um are you talking about the, the the boy's own hero yeah, no, no, the um, the uh, the location of of the Würzburg that they they oh, see. Oh, Captain Yes, yeah. that's one of the first uses of the oblique camera, the sort of sideways facing one in the in in the Spitfires, and we'll have more on that in this podcast in the future because, yeah, stuff. Um, but it's 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 fascinating, and then they of course have to take pictures of the entire coast so that it's not just them showing up to go back and forth. It, it's oh, it's fantastic. Look it up, ladies and gentlemen. It's great. Yeah, but. What's more exciting than Spitfires at low level taking pictures is dropping a couple dozen crazy people <laughs> <laughs> into Nicket. So this is Operation Biting, isn't it? And we start to get introduced to people who will become incredibly famous over the next the next few years for again doing remarkably silly things, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. Yeah, this is I guess this is this is the spiritual beginning of a parachute regiment this this is what they trace it all back to and it's it's, it's a mad operation um it, it was a new kind of operation because it involved the RAF to drop them um the, the army being dropped and the navy to pick them up but just over a, a hundred commandos were sent in to collect this thing um and what I loved, I loved going through the National Archives stuff on this because you get so many. Everyone wrote, they, they, they collected all of these personal accounts. And there's a mixture of the, the, 
the scared, the brusque, the you know, all these things. The, the account I love is from um, Frost, who who is who led it. Who you imagine the moment that you land, um, the moment when you're on occupied European soil for I think quite possibly the first. I mean, I'm sure there might have been others. It's very difficult to say the first, but I think it might have been the first since Dunkirk, the first sort of boots on the ground. Um, this is the moment of maximal danger, but they'd all drunk so much tea and rum on the flight over that all they could think of was that they really needed a wee. So they all christened Occupied Europe, and then then they went on their way. Um, and there was so one of one of the sticks of, of parachute shooters was dropped off target, uh, and they found themselves a few miles away. And there's this marvelous account of them, you know, go, going at a run in the direction they needed to be. Um, but on the way, to give you an idea of the sort of, sort of chaps these were, uh, some of them just took a diversion into Brunewald to kill some Germans. Um, and then, but they still made it on time. And then there, there was this surreal moment where, as they were jogging through the French countryside, some German who, God knows what was going on in his mind, must have thought, oh, this is my platoon or whatever, and I should have been with them, joined in behind them and started jogging until he realised too late what was going on, and he met a very sticky end. Um, but they got there, and they arrived, and they took out the, the villa and they, where everyone was based, and then they, they arrived at the, the Würzburg, and they started dismantling it, having killed everyone around it. Now, having killed... The interesting thing about coming to something at this stage is there were plenty of accounts. There was, there was a defining book on this, the Brunewald Raid, which was written in the, the 70s, I think. Um, but we now have the, um, the stuff from the National Archives that's been declassified. And in the post-war stuff, you get this wonderful description of this boy's own adventure. Um, and the prison they took, there's this comedy character, this German prisoner, who was, by all accounts, very stupid. And he was a radio operator. And he was scared. They, they found him hanging off a... Um, hanging off a cliff edge and it was all very very funny and he 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 was the light comic relief to the whole thing reading the uh re reading the national archive stuff you realize that what probably happened and i can't say this definitively but i'm pretty certain is they turned up and they executed everyone else in cold blood he got away um and then they pulled him back and then they interrogated him in not the gentlemanly interrogations we talked about in the Cockfoster's cage, but they, they, they beat him up and they extracted information from him. Um, but, you know, this was a brutal behind the, behind the enemy lines raid. Um, and then they, they pulled out this radar, uh, or a large part of it, and they got it down to the beach. The, the team that were off target arrived just in time to charge at the remaining um, German outpost, and they got to the beach. And once again, and, and it, it sounds like it's been scripted for a movie, just as they were giving up hope, the Navy arrived, just as the German reinforcements arrived on the cliff edge above them, the Navy were there with their browning machine guns to suppress them, um, and almost everyone got on. The, the losses from that raid were equivalent to the losses you would get from a bombing raid at the time uh you know it was about five percent didn't make it back and some of those some of those were prisoners what did they think of the equipment when they got their hands on it um they thought it was astonishingly high quality it wasn't you know, there were no great revelations but it was you know, I think we're all familiar with very well-made German consumer goods and that's what they were looking at um and in part that was a reflection of the fact that they wanted this to work with people who weren't technical specialists. They wanted this to just be something that could plug and play and be used by anyone, including the poor hapless dude they, they, they found hanging off a cliff. And that, that's what they had. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that made them think, oh, you know, the, the Germans are light years ahead of us. Uh, they, they just, they, they, they thought, well, we, we all understand the same principles, but they've just made a, Bang and Olufsen compared to our 
I mean, I can't even think of a, a UK brand Wharf, because Wharf they're Dale. old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Was it Wharfdale used to get at Woolworths? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 would, it would be sold at Woolworths, whatever yeah. the equivalent is. We're showing our age now, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, it's it's all just fascinating. And the thing that always makes me smile as well was Frey and Wurz, they're made by competing companies, weren't they, as well? So you, you've got that typical German rivalry going on behind the scenes to outdo, even though they're doing different things. It, oh, read about it, ladies and gentlemen, in Tom's book and, and, and prices. It's great. Now... I don't want to go into the countermeasure bits too much because that's the sort of the last third of your book. But one one of the things that I always find fascinating and you discuss to some level is the fear of using a countermeasure because as soon as you use it, it's no longer really as effective because the boffins on the other side will go, oh, what's that? And turn it yeah. against you. Windows, your sort of case study for it. How long did they hold off on using that? Because they were, you know, they 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 feared it was a one shot thing. It was it was months, arguably years, because it was known about from before the war. So, window is the simplest countermeasure you could conceive of. Um, it is stripped of tin foil. Uh, the, the thing about radar is it reflects off things. If you get a strip of tin foil, it's half the half the frequency or half the wavelength of the radar then it will send back a really really strong signal you drop a bundle of this and suddenly you you've just blinded the the radar the radar operator um and this was a simple enough idea that it was independently lighted on in britain by several different people including in one weird aside essentially by daily mirror cartoonist um who, who is just imagining stuff uh, and came up with this countermeasure and everyone in the Admiralty were like oh my god you know, <laughs> what's she done um so um, we tested it um a, a woman called joan curran sort of headed this up and, and at her kitchen table cut up strips of foil dropped them and we were appalled <laughs> at what it did to our radar um and then, as you say, resolve not to use it because you can't hide this stuff. If you drop it over Germany, it lands everywhere. And we just decided we can't let the Germans have this. We need radar more than them. Of course, the supreme irony was at almost exactly the same time, the Germans were trying out Dupel, which is was their name for window, which, by the way, is now known as Chaff. Um, and uh, exactly the same thing happened. They tried out Dupel. Um, Goering saw the results and ordered there be no more tests in case anyone sent sent these sort of little strips to the British. So it was months, this weird quirk of game theory. Eventually, we decided that the war had tipped, uh, after the fall of Stalingrad, that the war had tipped enough sort of in our in our favour that we, we should try, try this out. Because yeah, it was Hamburg and Peenemund. Actually, the, I, I, the, the, I, the I got that they? wrong. Yeah. There was a separate one, H2S, which was brought in for those reasons after the fall of Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. This was, yeah, this was before, before the <laughs> Hamburg raid. So we're talking the summer. We're, we're going to very briefly touch on that because H2S is the ground mapping radar, essentially very similar to what is, is still in use today. Not going to talk about it here, ladies and gentlemen, by the book. But the thing that struck me on that was... As boys with new toys do, they overuse stuff. What was Jones' reaction when he found out that essentially they were switching H to S on as as soon as they, as soon as they got on the runway? Essentially, well, yeah, it was I mean, it was it was utter fury. He he had by this stage, along with others. So, so I should probably say this, so the beans was you know basically Jones, um, and then as the war progressed, more people became involved in this. But he he was absolutely crucial, uh, and. He'd worked out what the German radar system was. Um, and with things like Window, you know, others had, had effectively neutralized it. So the Germans theoretically had very little in the way of useful early warning. And then the bombers switched on H2S, which gives you a lovely map of the ground below. And they started switching it on when they were still searching above their airfields in Britain. And it pr produced a wonderful loud signal. So you didn't need anything else. You could see this thing as it went over it. And they had this with h choice. They had this with interrogate friend or foe. So there was this thing where it would ping to say you're a friend and so the, the radar wouldn't, wouldn't need to bother you. Um, and 
that bombers, who were understandably superstitious because their life was largely a lottery, uh, came to the belief that this IFF signal, which should only really have been on over the channel, in some way interfered with German radar searchlights. Um, and so they kept on all the time. And it meant that if one bomber in the bomber stream had one of these things on, you knew where they were. Um, so yeah, Jones was absolutely incandescent. And it took a lot of going around, you know, giving talks to bombers and, and basically human persuasion to say, just don't do it, guys. <laughs> We we spend a lot of time talking about tech and gadgets and these in, these incredible, you know, bits of kit and the countermeasures against them. But you, human nature is a real, excuse the expression, bitch at times because that you know, yeah. if 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 there's a rumor going around that if you just flick this switch, you won't be picked up by a searchlight, and you're what twenty years old. And you're you're 20 years old, yeah. and you know that, you know, one flight, there's a one in 25 chance you die. Two flights, there's, you know, a one in 15 chance by then. I mean, you know, and and none of it's in your control. Mm. I mean, you know, yeah, you, you have utter, utter sympathy for them. And you get these, reading through the archives, you get this real sense of, the, the the tragedy of it in in brusque bureaucratic language. So there's talk about using them in various radio, radio uh, spotting roles, you, using people on the bombers or training them to bomb the radar sites or the beam sites. And this is decided against because it's not worth investing the training and the effort in these crews because they're simply not going to survive. Mm. It's the devil's maths, isn't it? It's it's a terrible, terrible thing. Which is <laughs> a very down mode to start wrapping things up with. The book is in the wild now. Looking back on all your research, the time you've spent with these remarkable people, whether it's Joan Kern cutting up her tinfoil in a front room or, or Jones yeah, regaling Churchill with these mystical beams. What's your lasting sort of takeaway from, from, the, from doing the book? It's that I am. Um, I, I, I thought about this a lot. So I told in this book the stories I can tell. Um, I hope I've given a slice of what was going on, and probably I'm, I'm a science writer. Probably a better historian would have been able to really give an overview of, of what happened. But the the sheer scale of this scientific battle, I think, is something that that hasn't always come across you know we know about code breaking and we know about the, the manhattan project and stuff but there are a vast number of scientists working this and i've given a sliver and i i wish you know maybe, maybe there's a sequel or, or maybe maybe there's maybe there's even a better writer who can do it but i'm aware that my grandparents were involved in this and i never spoke to them about it and they worked on Decca navigation which was the system um, used by a precursor to GPS used by the Navy. Um, that's an entire scientific tale in the radio war that I haven't touched on. And there was so much going on, and so many characters who cut their teeth later on. And, you know, people like Sir Bernard Lovell, um, who became a famous radio astronomer, all of these people who were emptied into Britain's scientific institutions. It really was a massive effort, which. Uh, well, I'm a book, but I'm not even sure I've done justice to it. I think you did a pretty good job. I enjoyed <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm as we were saying before. I'm I'm a Jones fan. I I love Most Secret War. Alfred Price's book is is fabulous as well. I think yours, in that you sort of you split it between sort of defense and attack, and and look at those sort of sections in um, not in isolation, but in in a sort of concise way. I, th I think you've, you've you've done it really well. Yeah. Make people read the, read the maths. It's, it's what Hugh Seabag <laughs> Montefiore did with Enigma, wasn't it? It was like here's now ten pages of, <laughs> of how, how to crack, to how to crack it. it. Yeah. But Tom, thank you ever so much for this. This has been fantastic fun. the The book is out now. I thoroughly recommend it. It's it's a really great read. And thank you for for coming on the show. Thank you very much indeed. That was good fun. I cannot thank Tom Whipple enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. That was a lot of fun. 
it is not often I get to geek out with someone about R.V. Jones, who is a small obsession of mine. He is a remarkable character. And like we said, he's probably just as likely to tell you he was a remarkable character, should you have ever met him. Tom's book, The Battle of the Beans, is out now here in the UK by Bantam and Penguin. And I have to thank Tom Hill over at Penguin for sending a copy over for me to have a little look at early, because, like I said, I really enjoyed it. Of course, if you're in the UK, you can also get it at the Damcasters Bookshop. Link in the description below. 10% goes to supporting the pod. Also put R.V. Jones's book in there as well, which is just wonderful fun. It is really, really good read. Get Tom's first then read Jones's and of course links to Tom's social media accounts and what he's up to on the times which is very interesting at the moment because they are well into this AI business whether or not it's going to kill us all who knows we'll find out um or maybe if AI is listening to this I for one welcome our AI overlords and hope that they enjoy aviation history style content until next time Thank you all so much for listening. As always, tell your friends, share the news, let everyone know about this fantastic aviation history podcast that you know about. Or if it's not fantastic, let me know and I'll see what I can do about it. Leave some stars. Patreon's there if you want it. But thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, when we've got a couple fantastic episodes about Len Dighton's bomber, join us then. Take care. Bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowe and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.